All right. Welcome to the first episode of the Inside Tech podcast uh, brought to you by Statson. Your hosts are Karri Takki, me. I'm head of growth at Statson and uh, technology enthusiast myself. And my co-host is our data journalist, Rico. Maybe you can introduce yourself. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Rika Melissa. I'm the data journalist for StatZone. I handle mostly the uh, content writing for our website. So mostly I do the inside article and I write mostly about electric mobility. And yeah, electric mobility will be the theme of our podcast series this time. We picked it up as it's uh, one of the trending areas currently uh, on the public audience. Also very interesting, definitely. But what does actually e-mobility mean? I have the definition here on my hand. I can read it to you. So e-mobility loosely defined as electrifying transportation fleets. This includes all three transportation, such as cars, bikes, scooters, buses, and so on. Uh, but it also includes ships and boats and other seagoing transportation modes. The basic idea behind e-mobility is basically to uh, replace the use of fossil fuels and instead use green eco-friendly energy to power the transport fleet. This includes the use of electricity and also hydrogen. Some of you are wondering about hydrogen. I had the same experience also before I started writing about e-mobility. I didn't know there's this type of uh, electric car which is run on hydrogen. It's called the fuel cell electric vehicle or FCEV for short. The fuel cell works by converting hydrogen and oxygen from the air into electricity through a chemical reaction. And the result is completely zero emission. Yeah, it's very interesting to hear how big industry is the e-mobility. It's not, of course, official industry as by classification. And also hard to say what is the market size because, of course, it depends what do you include there. But most of the people don't even think, for example, hydrogen solutions as part of the e-mobility. But yes, they are there also. I can add also that there's also the talk to take e-mobility to the sky. This is quite uh, new. Uh, so there's this movement to uh, electrify the planes also. It's probably still very far to reach the mainstream market. But definitely the trend is growing towards electric planes. There's already one jet flying on fully electric battery last year. I think it was in September 2022. It was Alice. It's a nine-seat passenger jet from the company Aviation Aircraft, and it has successfully flown in the sky last year for a full eight minutes. So it's not that long, but the plan is to get at least to fly for one or two hours in the near future. Yeah, I, I think definitely like the one of the biggest issues probably for aviation is that the battery solutions, the batteries, they weigh a lot. And that's why I think there's also a lot of like potential also on the hydrogen research there because of the weight issues. And yeah, also in the battery weight, I think, yeah, in the, for example, in the road traffic, that's not uh, so significant. If you think, for example, if you take the normal in the uh, combustion engine car and you remove the heavy engine, you get already some weight off the car before you start adding the weight through the batteries. Yeah, for the passenger car, I think we don't really have any problem now uh, with the battery technology. But uh, as I have read, we still have challenge when we talk about other modes of transportation like uh, heavy load trucks because then uh, we will need a bigger battery for that kind of vehicles. The battery, the weight of the battery, it presents a kind of challenge to be added to the already very heavy vehicles. Yeah, I've encountered some companies who are making like lightweight trucks for the city area distribution. And of course, Tesla has their truck uh, for which at least is claimed to be able to cover quite long distances, but it's still a question what kind of loads it is able to transport from place to place. Like the electric cars, I think the, in the normal passenger cars, it's getting now significantly popular and the market is growing fast. Uh, 
do you have some insight when you have been researching the EV industry and so on? How many electric cars there are at the moment? Yeah, I have a little bit of data on that. I took it from the IEA website, which is the International Energy Association. So the sales hit 10 million units in 2022. So that's the sale for passenger electric car. Uh, it includes both uh, battery electric vehicles, which is a fully electric car, and also PHEV. One of every seven cars sold in 2022 was electric. And in total, there's around 26 million units of EV roaming the roads globally as per IEA data for the year 2022. However, when compared to traditional gas power cars, the figure is still relatively small, as EV account for less than 2% of all the cars available in the world. Yeah, I think uh, currently I saw some news headlines that in Finland uh, we are approaching on the electric plus hybrid cars that sales would be like 35 to 40 percent of, if I recall right, of the, all the new cars. You are um, correct. I have the yeah. data here actually. So the EV sales in Finland for the year 2022 is 38 percent and it's actually above average, uh, above the Europe average because the sales share for Europe is 21 percent. And I have to say, I, I guess a lot of people know already that Norway is leading in almost every metric of uh, electric vehicle survey. In Norway, the sales share hit 88% last year. And if we talk the global scale, the sales share is 14%. Yeah, that's uh, very interesting, like how the different countries are going forward in different speeds, different states at the moment. And in Europe, definitely the goal is that there would be no internet combustion engine cars anymore sold 2035. So it will probably take still several decades before all the cars are electric on the roads. But uh, yeah, in certain parts of Europe, and Europe is generally getting electric quite fast. How is the other areas in the world? Uh, I think there is uh, at least uh, North America and uh, China, which are also rapidly selling more and more electric cars. Uh, is there any other areas interesting you are aware of where there would be significant share of the electric cars sold? Yes, of course. China is uh, the biggest market for EV right now. In 2022, uh, the sales share, let me check, uh, it hits almost 30% in China. Uh, of course, it's a lot smaller. If you compare it to Norway, I mean the share, but of course, in terms of quantity, it means that uh, China sells a lot more of uh, electric vehicle compared to any other part of the world. Yeah, that's interesting. And yeah, I think yeah, a lot of people who are planning to buy a new car in near future are boundering constantly. Should they get the electric car or should they get plug-in hybrid or should they stick still the rel reliable internal combustion engine as it's still a new technology. So there is also people have a lot of skepticism. Will it work for them? Is it enough for them? And how reliable they are and so on. Yeah, but uh, as I know, Kari, you just bought an electric vehicle a fully electric car for yourself, right? Can you tell me like the thought process behind your decision? Um, I had before a diesel car, so very traditional combustion engine car. And I was also thinking that maybe I take first a hybrid car, plug-in hybrid, because I was not sure is the electric car going to be in the Finnish winter uh, good enough? Will the range be enough for my use? But uh, when I was... Evaluating my options, it was last summer when used uh, plug-in hybrids and electric cars cost more than the new ones in Finland, at least. And I think it was situation in many European countries also at that time. And then I decided, okay, whatever, then let's get a new car. Then if it's the uh, same price or cheaper, then I went to try some plug-in hybrids. And then I started thinking, okay, yeah, these are nice. Then I tried some electric cars. I thought, okay, they seem quite good. And I studied a little bit of what kind of range I can expect in the winter conditions when it's cold. And 
then I would realize that most of the cars can reach 300 kilometers at least in the heaviest winter, which I was considering. And I thought, okay, that's enough. I rarely drive 300 kilometers and more rarely I drive more than 300 kilometers without stopping anyway. Then other concern I had there was, then I was thinking that if I take a plug-in hybrid, I will have the combustion engine and I have the electric car in the same package. So if there is any technical issues, I will have from the boat technologies then. So I thought the electric car is at least simpler technology-wise. I agree with you. Uh, as uh, I have read, a range, a average range of EV is right now probably around 350 kilometer, as uh, you just mentioned. Uh, may I know the range of your car? I mean, in ideal condition, so not yeah, really so, in the peak of winter. Yeah, if I recall right, my car is the VLTP, the official range is 550 kilometers or so. Uh, now that the, the weather is warmer, at least I haven't tried it myself, but when I charge full, the estimate based on my driving style, I could reach the 500 plus kilometers without charging. That's actually yeah, quite the, amazing. Yeah, yeah. In the winter, in February, I think the theoretically in a very good conditions, I could have reached barely 400 kilometers. We didn't have really a cold, difficult winter this year, so uh, it's still to be seen how in the real winter conditions the car performs. And are you happy with that range? I mean, like, are you the kind of person who used to drive for a uh, very long kilometers per day or? Yeah, um, I would say that after the world in the pandemic, I barely go to office anymore. My daily longest trips are probably 50 kilometers, 80 kilometers a day when I drive on average. So yeah, that's more than enough. I don't need to even charge the car every day. Yeah, and I have also a little bit of data here. So I came across a study that says people in Europe are driving less and less each year. In the European Union, the numbers dropped from 13,000 kilometers per year in the year 2000 to 11,000 kilometers per year in 2019. In Finland, the drop is even bigger. It's from 19,000 to 13,000 kilometers per year because of the better uh, facility for the public transportation. So if you want to calculate the daily range, so people in Europe is actually driving around, I would say 30 to 35 kilometers per day. So if you have a range of 300 kilometers on your electric car, yeah, I agree that it's more than enough. Yeah, when I was going through the, this kind of uh, social media groups for uh, electric cars where people discuss them, it it's really funny to see how it always comes up. Or if you see the news articles and you look at the comments, people are saying, but you cannot drive to the Lapland without uh, stopping. Driving to Lapland takes you depending where you are going there, but anything from eight to 12 hours. I don't think too many people in Finland even drive that long distances, even we have long distances straight. And the good thing is that, yeah, at home, the charging is slow, but on the road, if you have to take more energy, electricity, as long as the charging network is strong enough that you find the chargers, I don't see any problem to stop for 15 minutes in a long trip to take a little bit more electricity that you can reach your destination. You need a break yourself also. You need to visit the toilet. You might want a cup of coffee. Yeah, that's true. But now after a few months of driving electric car, like uh, how do you feel? How is the situation in Finland? Have you ever had any problem finding a place to recharge your car? Yeah, um, I haven't charged much um, car outside home, to be honest. In the first few weeks, I charged on the way because... I wanted to be sure that I reach in the longer trip to the location uh, or that I can come back from the location without charging. I might have charged. But now after that, the only time I have charged was the one morning when I overslept and I had to drive to our office in Lahti, which is 100 kilometers away from where I live. Uh, I had to charge actually in the parking hall there. Luckily, there also was the public charging point. Uh, that I was able to charge the car because I was not planning to drive. I was planning to take a train, so I had not charged enough battery because usually I give my charge around 50, 60% if I'm not planning to go for 
longer distance. And uh, charging in general, I think yeah, it's an interesting topic and how I think the home charging will be the most important factor that people are able to have a charging at home. With the ranges, you said average range is over 300 kilometers already on the EVs sold. With that trains, very few, few times a year, you need to charge on, a, on the road, on the public charger. So definitely home charging is probably most important. For those who drive plug-in hybrids, they need charging at uh, work also. But those who have an EV, they don't probably need than the home charge, usually home charger. Uh, but I guess the charging network is one of the things besides, of course, the supply issues with electric cars, which is limiting the growth of the EV around the world. And the price also, I have to say, the capital price of owning an electric vehicle, it's still relatively very high, uh, as I know. The average price of electric car is around 20% more expensive than the average car. In the US, uh, I think there's a article talking, saying that uh, the price of electric car is actually closer to the price of a luxury car in the US. So uh, you can imagine like uh, it's difficult to adopt electric car, especially for people in developing worlds. That's why uh, electric car has not yet taken off in that part of the world. Uh, so yeah, we still need to wait until the price to come down a little bit more. So then it get it can be more dominant uh, on the roads. Yeah, but uh, what I believe is that actually the prices are now coming down. Uh, like Tesla has this year already chopped several times their prices because of their very good margins they have. They can cut the prices and also the other car manufacturers are getting their production lines in order, their logistics working better and better for electric vehicles. So I believe the price is coming down. Tesla has already reached in US, I think, was it very near to $30,000 or $35,000 uh, at the lowest, which is for a new car. I think it's a quite reasonable price already and the biggest issue is probably that uh, mo most of the people they they buy a used car i usually also prefer little used cars and in the ev side that there's a huge push now to get the electric car when the gas prices is, are going up the demand is so high that there is not enough uh, used evs yet and there's also the other thing is people are not sure how reliable the batteries are in the old ones. So that's why you see a lot of uh, EV manufacturers also giving very long warranty on their batteries that uh, people can take the risk to buy the car. And I also thinking that I will sell my car after the car's own warranty is over and the only battery warranty is still valid. Because I believe that it will be much more difficult to sell it as used car when the battery is not anymore under warranty. There's a little bit of good news, uh, as far as I know. The price of battery has come down also uh, at the first part of the year, because last year in 2022, the price went up a lot. I mean, since the pandemic, yeah, the price of battery went up a lot. And people were afraid that electric car is not going to be easy to adopt because of the price. But uh, a lot of people actually didn't know why the price suddenly goes down this year. But yeah, it's good news for everyone, I guess. Yeah, the batteries is definitely, and there's constantly new technologies lurking behind the corner, which make batteries more efficient. Uh, they reduce the weight of the batteries. Uh, they make them cheaper to manufacture, etc. And uh, definitely, I believe, yeah, the prices will keep coming down when the technology gets more major. Um, but yeah, the prices are going down, but yeah, the limiting factor, of course, that besides the EV supply and the price is like, if you want to buy a car, how is the charging possibilities? In some countries, it might be that the home charging might be difficult to get because of the charging station would need the power and the fuses in the house are not big enough. Uh, in Finland, because we use a lot of electricity for heating and so on, that's not usually an obstacle, but in some countries, in the warmer countries, it might be an issue. And also, there is there a public charging network built in the country? Because obviously, people don't dare to buy a car if you cannot charge it on the road trip. Uh, how is actually the charging 
in general globally? What is the situation there? Do you have some insight for that? Uh, well, I have here uh, first the data on Finland. Finland has around 9,000 charging points. 15% of that number are the DC fast charging points. As for uh, the electric cars, in 2022, there were around 150,000 electric cars in Finland, 100,000 PHEV and around 50,000 BEV. So the ratio between the charging points and the electric cars is 1 to 16, uh, which is actually still higher than the EU recommendation because the recommendation is to have one charging point for every 10 electric cars. But uh, the good thing about Finland is that the share of uh, DC fast charging points is quite okay. 15% is quite a good number. It's interesting actually to pick this ratio also, yeah, how many you should have. And we are talking now about public chargers. So this doesn't include yeah. the private Home locations gym. like homes and work offices usually. So actually in Finland, you can find one charging station in every 50 kilometer radius. Uh, in southern Finland, which is uh, more densely populated, the ratio actually goes down to one charging station in every 25 kilometer radius. So I think it's not that bad. It's actually quite good. Compared to other countries, I don't have the global data here, but if you want to compare it to other countries, uh, in the US, they have 130,000 charging points. Uh, in Germany, they have the most number of charging points compared to other countries in Europe. So they have around 80,000. And in Norway, they have 25,000 of charging points. And uh, also like Finland, uh, the share of the DC charging points is quite high also in Norway. Yeah, that's, uh, I think at least my experience in Finland is that uh, I haven't need to charge. I haven't even passed the charging stations during the holiday season when people are moving a lot. But on average day, uh, I've rarely seen that all the charging points would have been in use. The last time I did the road trip, there was probably in the gas station there was I think 15 charging points, and only one third of them were in use. So it was very easy to find one. Of course, I've heard that for during like a Christmas season and so on, that certain areas are choke points, but that's also the charging point operators has a challenge there to have their capacity where it is needed, as you don't need it in the necessary in the city centers, you need it on the roads between the major cities usually, which is probably what they are working constantly at the moment. Uh, I think big issue with charging is more of to find the charging station where you can pay with your existing apps or tax you are carrying with you. There's so many operators, even in Finland, uh, that um, I'm also only able to use few of them. I don't want to have a hundred apps on my phone and doing the lottery. So I have chosen a few of the biggest ones and I use only their network if I need to charge. But the payment uh, process is uh, interesting in the electric cars when you refuel it, so-called. Normally you go to gas station with an intercompassing engine car and you pay with your card, credit card. And that's it. You have your full tank. But with the electric car, you have to check that you have the payment solution of your gas station. Uh, I read in, in the UK, they have also some kind of uh, card system. It's not, it's, I'm not talking about debit card or the usual uh, credit card, but it's a special card that you use to pay for uh, charging your car. I guess it's almost similar as having uh, the app on your phone. So, but yeah, as you say, like interoperability is still a big problem uh, when it comes to charging. In UK, most people have four cards, they say. So they wouldn't have a problem of finding a charging station, but they don't have uh, the means to pay for it. Yeah, and uh, I was planning like a road trip in Europe and yeah, figure out that the, most of my, what I have access now here, those operators don't exist in Europe. So I have to figure out like if I want to do a road trip to, for each country, who are the operators there who have the best network or at least best network for my road. So it needs a little bit of research that you are not finding yourself with the 2% of battery left on the charging station, figuring out 
Is it enough to download the app and add your credit card there, or is this station one which requires specific card or tag to pay? But there is also the roaming system, right? I think you explained it to me a little bit before. Maybe you can uh, explain it to me again. Yeah, there is, of course, like um, Finnish company Virta, for example, they offer this kind of roaming access that you can pay with their either tag or their app uh, in the selected charging point operators networks. But of course, with the roaming, then your price might be significantly different. For example, the charging station near my house, which I used before I had the charging at home possible, uh, I checked the price was 30 cents per kilowatt hour more expensive if I would have used the roaming than the one I used. So yeah, the, but the roaming can save you a lot. That's why I also have uh, this kind of roaming operators also payment to like to be used in emergencies. So when the, it doesn't matter if it's a little bit more expensive one shot that I don't at least need to get the car towed somewhere because I ran out of the power. But it's I believe there will be a solutions and uh, we have to get this season somebody uh, from the charging operators or device manufacturers to talk with us. It would be nice to hear how they are seeing this in the future because I don't believe that uh, it is the best uh, or long lasting solution how the, we pay for charging at the moment. Uh, there must be some kind of a standard coming up, but who is driving it and so on. I haven't seen anything concrete, so it would be nice to talk with somebody from the who is working on developing the charging networks. Do you have any idea or uh, maybe like uh, a kind of estimation how much do you save if you compare the price of electricity compared to the price of uh, petrol, like do you do you know how much you spend to charge your yeah. car? I have. Uh, I know some people are making uh, very detailed excels and so on, calculating their costs. I have my car's app is tracking the charges, but the prices are not. I have set it up the prices in different locations a little bit higher than they are really. For example, I'm looking uh, last month, uh, which was the May, uh, uh, March, the full month, and I used roughly 48 euros charging the car. And if I would have refueled for those kilometers fuel, I would have paid 200 euros. So the fuel costs are definitely lower and maintenance, if nothing seriously big breaks down, but the regular maintenance is much cheaper than in my old car because electric cars barely have a maintenance needs. So there is some savings, but as I said earlier, the cost of the car currently, this is the most expensive car I've ever had. So the capital cost there is of course own factor and other thing, I'm planning to keep the car for about three to four years. What is the value when I start selling it. If the new cars are coming down, it means that also the used car market comes down. So it's hard to say like how much I lose more. Car is never an investment. I ha I do understand that. It's just a question how much money you lose uh, with the car when you have it. But to your question, operating expenses are much cheaper. I would say on average, yeah, expecting 150 euros at least a month savings, maybe 200 when I calculate in all the maintenance costs. I see a lot of people, as you say, making this uh, detailed calculation on their operational cost of driving an electric car. And uh, some people say that they will drive the car for uh, this kilometer or how many years until they get to the point that the total cost of ownership is cheaper than the total cost of ownership from their previous car. Are you planning to do that also? No, I'm, I'm planning the three, four years uh, until the, warrant, the factory warranty is over, uh, then I will change. But let's say if I save every month at around 150, 200 euros, so a couple of thousand euros a year, so six to 8,000 euros cheaper than intercombustion engine car. And yeah, that already if the cars, uh, value doesn't drop faster than the, my previous cars. It makes this quite okay. It's not that much more expensive after all, when I take that 6,000, 8,000 euro saving into account. But yeah, I haven't done the calculation. My only calculation was that what price of car I can afford without that I have to start regulating my costs in a month. Uh, back to that 
what you mentioned about the failure of the car. Uh, I think most people think that electric car failure drops faster than the traditional petrol car. Uh, so do you have the same idea? Um, I would say I don't have. And like I said, I cannot even assume what is the resale value of my car. Last summer when I was buying a car, some people were selling used cars more expensive than the new ones were of the same model. That was because of the lot of issues in the new cars delivery times that there was like 14 months and so on. What was told me that on the delivery times, but then now the prices have starting to return to normal. Uh, it's a little bit like a demand is matching a little bit of the supply better now. Mm -hmm. But then on the other end, for example, Tesla has been doing several price cuts. And suddenly, if you get, let's say you have bought a car six months ago, and now you get a new car, 15,000 or more cheaper as a new. So obviously that hits the resale value of the specific Tesla models, but also other electric cars. Like who is looking for used electric car, they are looking what are the reasonable price range for them. And of course, then the good options define it, which are in the lowest price point, what is the reasonable to pay for it. But yeah, I think the market is still not ma major in a sense. A lot of uh, disturbances and fluctuation there. I don't think anybody knows how their price, the electric car resale value will drop over the time. Like for internet combustion engine cars, there's statistics, how many percent the car's value you can expect to drop each year. But for EV, I believe that it, after all the fluctuation, it will probably settle to around the same as the ICE cars. Uh, so I assume you are now driving a Tesla, right? I don't think we mentioned before uh, what brand of car you decided to buy, right? Did you also consider any other brands? Yeah, I tried quite many of the ones which were available in Finland in the size and the price range. I was ready to pay. And yeah, Tesla was not even clear number one uh, at that time. What was your number but one? Number one, what kind of space wise was Skoda Enyaq, space wise and price wise. But then the, the delivery time out there was like 14 months, which was promised kind of before you buy. And Tesla was that time, I think, was six, seven months, which was the fastest delivery time. And it was still good, uh, like a con uh, good package, let's say, the, on the technology range, price, everything feeling wise. So I went for that because it was coming quite fast. And but now I, I know the delivery times are getting more normal. So I'm curious to see like in three, four years when it's time to change the car, which ones I take. And I believe that the other manufacturers also are catching up Tesla in the areas where they are strong, like software side. Now that after a few months of driving, uh, what do you like the most about driving an electric car? I would say the power uh, of the car, it's when you press the pedal, it reacts immediately. And of course, like my previous car was already seven, eight years old, so not the newest technology there. So all the automated systems in the car are also nice. Despite there is a box, uh, disturbing box time to time in the systems, but uh, that was also the case with uh, when I compared to different brands that everybody had the software issues. I think the biggest issues with the new electric car seems to be the software side ones. Is there anything that you miss from driving a traditional gas car? Nothing really. Or yeah, if I have to say one thing is that the ease of payment of the on the gas pump versus the charging stations. So what if you live in an apartment, would you still consider to have an electric car? Or would you buy some other car? I would have considered it probably longer because uh, if you don't get charging at the apartment, the one downside is, of course, you in the public stations, you pay probably like I, I compare my home electricity price versus the cheapest near public station is 1.5 times more expensive. OK, if my charging costs are 48 euros per month, it's not that significant, but annoying more it's more of an annoyance yeah i think we have covered 
anything that we need to cover for this yeah, episode. Yeah, I think this was, yeah, I think this, uh, yeah, was good intro and uh, I'm looking forward to when we get actual experts and guests to talk about the different areas of the e-mobility and challenges and we will have probably some interesting companies uh, from the e-mobility sector on different areas visiting us also telling a little bit of from their point of view how they are tackling the market at the moment. Yeah. All right. But uh, until the next episode. Until next episode. A special offer for our listeners. We are giving you full access to statistics for 30 days by registering at statson.com with the code STATSON, spelled S-T-A-T-Z-O-N. And thanks for listening to our podcast. For more market insights, visit our website and get our Tech360 newsletter. If you enjoyed this podcast, subscribe, recommend the podcast to your colleagues, friends, and family, and follow us on social media.